Hello. Okay, today we'll be looking at Thomas Struve. Um, as mentioned the last time, we did Gursky. Now, Struve is one of uh, the contemporaries of Gursky. So, naturally, he is German. He's a photographer. Uh, that much you know. Um, one thing that I also mentioned is that he did study at this place, the uh, Kunstar Academy, the Stoff or in English, the Dustoff Academy, uh, under the same teacher, this Byrne and Hiller Becher. Uh, but before he did that, he did study painting. This was under Jihad Ricker, as some of you may know. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do next is similar to what we did with Gursky. I'm going to show you some of Thomas Drew's works, and then they can actually be quite nicely classified into certain themes. So we're going to look at them team by team. Uh, same, thing, same thing as... Um, same thing as Gursky, I want you to start thinking as you look through at all these images, what are the things that come to mind? Okay, what are the things that come to mind? How will you describe what you see here in the images to someone who, say, has not seen uh, Struth's work? Alright, I'm sure you are thinking of like things like, okay, the, say the most obvious, again, think of the five-year-old. What is it? Black and white photography. What do you see? Buildings. What else do you see? There's a vanishing point. Your position in the middle of the street. Okay, slightly different, but still same thing. The street, the building's feature. How will you describe the subject matter? It to be architecture, maybe? Okay, so what I've just mentioned, black and white taken from the street, vanishing point. Ah, this one last thing I hope you noticed. It shows buildings, but no people at all, which is kind of odd kind of odd. In fact, it kind of brings off this um, slightly apocalyptic kind of feeling, don't you think? Okay, so in case you think that, alright, this is this uh, the Birchers written all over it, uh, I need to correct you on that point. Uh, before he was the student of the Birchers, he already started taking photos like these. Yeah, so this one, um, I wouldn't consider it uh, influenced by them, although he does have quite a lot of positive things to say about what he learned from them. Okay, I'm going to the next ones, and it's going to look quite different. Quite different, yeah? Okay, again, what, how you describe these? What do you see? Yes, this is the Richter family. Um, this will be Gerhard Richter. He's a painter, so this is his work, I suppose. Okay, these people you should know. Um, this is the queen and husband. Okay, what do you notice about notice about this now? It's kind of swung to the other extreme. From no people, suddenly it's all about the people, isn't it? Right? Definitely people will consider this to be portraiture. Um, the subjects, they are fully aware that that um, you are taking a picture of them. They're all looking straight on at you. Um, and, okay, people appear to be related. What do I mean? You know that these are uh, the king and queen, um, or rather the queen and prince Philip. They are related. This is a family. Uh, these two are mother and daughter as well. It's very somber in tone in the sense that they are not uh, in the midst of a celebration. They are not joyful. But at the same time, you cannot call them dispassionate. Um, they are holding quite strong... Feelings in them in some sense. I mean, look at this little girl. Uh, the queen, although she's not beaming, she's definitely not not um looking uh, uh she's definitely not looking uh dead neutral either. So I wouldn't consider it to be dispassionate. Okay, and then something else quite different. People for sure. What else do you notice? I'm gonna spend a little bit longer here. Okay, where is this place? These people, who are they? How does what is in the foreground work with what is in the background? In the front, you definitely say people, museum. And in the back, what do you notice? How you describe those paintings? You have seen these ones before. And these are highly recognisable paintings. Okay, do you notice any similarities? Okay, let's try and take that all in. Okay, people. 
Definitely, photographed in large formal museum settings with the images uh, as displayed on the wall, specifically the paintings. The people seem to correlate to the paintings in number and in positioning of themselves. Just looking at these two alone, isn't it quite obvious? Looking at how the person in the foreground is actually complementing or working with the image in the background. Okay, next series. Suddenly, eh, from architecture to people now to plants. Ah. Okay, I also want you to take note of the titles here. Paradise 19. Uh, the numbering has something to do with it. Okay, that's number 4. That's number 9. Do you notice about the locations as well? Let's look again. Ah. This is in China. This is in Australia. And this is... I have no idea where this is, but I presume this is the location. Okay, and likewise, because it's taken in such different climates, the trees look so different. Now, what on earth is truth up to here? Okay, let's just start by going a bit slower and looking. How will we describe what is the subject matter here? Okay, it's definitely a jungle-like space. Uh, suddenly, from either having a lot of people or no people. Okay, uh, but what you do have a lot of is the plant, and it's very cluttered. Visually, it's very cluttered. Think of Gursky right now. Think of Gursky, his stock market, the visual clutter that's going on. Isn't it quite, uh, isn't it working in the same way a bit uh, like what is going on here as well? Think of Pollock's paintings. Okay, you can tell that these are gathered from a range of locations. Ah, okay. I think this is the last group of them. This is quite different again. Uh, Gursky definitely comes to mind. Uh, think of his Siemens factory. But at the same time, what's the difference? What's the difference between um, this particular solar panel making factory and when Gursky was uh, taking a picture of the industrial uh, Siemens company? Yeah, that one you notice there are people, there are workers, but right now it's as if they've all gone on a lunch break and they're all not here. But at the same time, what stands out to you, the first thing that pops to mind? Machinery. So much machinery. And this place. Space shuttle. Definitely this foreign, um, very high-tech thing going on. You can imagine people using these. If you could put one word to all of these, what would it be? One word for this, one word for this, one word for this. You know? Uh, to me, this would be machinery, this would be design technology, this would be science and research. Okay. He has been going into places that with machines and manufacturing involved. Uh, these are places that involve scientific research. Um, again, there's no people, um, but like the cities, like the cities that you saw earlier, a city is built for who, for what? Although it looks so post-apocalyptic, it's because it's precisely because you know that you're expecting to see people there. You're expecting to see people there. Uh, likewise, in this environment as well, these things don't occur like this and you go out and find them. You find them because these are actual places that um, that is man-made, is human-driven, but at the same time, kind of foreign to you. We don't see this every day unless you have um, special permission and you work in these places. Okay, so to sum it up very quickly, we've looked at uh, quite a range of it. Now, uh, Struth range is, is slowly expanding, but I'm just going to focus on, on these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 areas because these are quite large bodies of, of uh, work that he has done. Okay, uh, at this point, I need to tell you that we're going to watch two videos together. Um, I literally would need you to stop, pause this YouTube video now and go to this other link. Now, this link is actually quite long. It's this interviewer talking with Struff. Uh, Struff, although he's German, he, he speaks English as well. Um, but I think the most useful part is actually this three plus minutes over here. So I'll ask you to kindly ignore the rest of the interview because it will take you quite a long time and just go straight to 5.10 to 8.32. Now what we're going to do when we come back is that I'm going to discuss with you some of the things that you caught from the video. So I ask that as you watch the video, can you have your notebook beside you as well and quickly pen down all the catchphrases that, the, that they use to describe all the things that satisfy all the 
who, what, when, where, why, how, and catch all those details because we're going to use that to discuss later. Okay, uh, I'll try to put the link in the video description. Okay, welcome back. I hope you have watched the video. If you haven't, go and watch it and take your notes. Okay, if you're done that, now I'm going to continue. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to discuss based on all these categories. Yeah, so let's start with what you caught from the video. So this is what I caught from the video. Yeah, um, in black, he studied under the batches. Okay, uh, the, now this one I want to add in a little bit more information for, for you. This Dustoff Academy, um, the students, they study quite closely under the mentorship of a specific artist. So when he was taught by Jahat Ricker, he was really learning just painting. And when he was taught by uh, Brent and Hiller Becker, um, I think they taught him more than photography, but you must uh, see that it was a very close mentoring experience for him. Okay, what other things that we caught? I, I like how the how the lady narrated that uh, he has this unconscious places going on. Now, it's not a fancy name that she gave it, but uh, really the name that he titles the whole series uh, for. Now, this series is a series that lasted quite long. So, he started this very early on. You saw his black and white photos of what? Of urban spaces, cityscapes almost devoid of people. Um, the video also mentioned his museum series. Uh, specifically, I like how they show you the Prado Museum. A museum that traditionally holds so much historical paintings, suddenly showing a very contemporary piece of work. But one that works best when it's really placed there. It's really placed there as if you're looking... You're looking at other people looking at the works. It's, it's a very uncanny but perfect placement. Now, the Paradise series, now this is the part you saw about the plants I showed you earlier, as well as the Machinery series. Uh, I like what she said as well as a metaphor for irrational belief in progress, the world of science and technology as a venue, as well as she highlighted just a little bit about portraits. But how? Not too much, but one key part, when, especially towards the end of the video, when he talks about uh, his camera, an 8x10 inch camera. Uh, I'm not going to go much into this because you notice that Gursky uses this kind of camera as well. Yeah? And he mentioned because of the resolution. Now why, why all these um, strange and uh, differentiated themes for, for Struf, right? The lady mentioned that these unfamiliar spaces that he managed to bring into the public view and it captures the public using the lure of the unknown. So it's a bit different from um, Gursky. I wouldn't use the word sublime for, for Struth, but definitely there's this lure of the unknown. There's something mysterious about the, his photographic works. She mentioned that from jungle he moved into machines, uh, from chaos in the natural world and then to the mechanical world. Um, under So What, just a little bit as well, uh, mentioned that he's the first living artist to show at the Prado and that it is his museum series that was one of the early peaks in his career. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to watch video 2. Uh, this time this video is much longer, you can see it's 13 minutes long, but trust me, it's worth it. Uh, the difference between this video and the other one is that in this time it's in Gursky's own words, so he's actually walking you through uh, his his works and explaining to you a little bit about what he was thinking uh, as he did those. So please do watch the full clip and again take down all the parts that, that um, caught you and we're going to go through them one by one. Yeah, I'll try and put the link in the description below. Okay, please pause and go and watch. Okay, I'm going to assume that you have watched. Huh? You must watch so that the next part will make sense to you. Okay, uh, we're gonna this time go through a little bit different. I tried to put it in the who, what, why, and so how, but because this video is quite long, if I do that, uh, it's gonna be all of text and very hard to follow. So I'm gonna cl go chronologically according to what he mentioned, all right? Now, he first talked about the interest in cities. Okay. I like how he described it because Gorski is quite an interesting person. He talks about the history, personal and collective experiences. He starts off talking about this at the building stage, but when he, you realize that when he gets to um, when he gets to technology, I think this collective experiences um 
okay, it's there, but more so about human development. Where are we going? Where's, where is this uh, technology thing in its place in history? Where are we going with it? So this word history pops out a lot, a lot of uh, in all his works, even though they may look quite different. Yeah, Think about the museum part as well. Why that kind of works? Why not uh, have the people standing beside another contemporary piece of work? But no, he specifically puts it where history is present. Okay? So he mentioned that cities consider a phenomenon that concerns every one of us. Um, at this point, he mentioned uh, Naples and Rome and how cities are built quite differently, how old buildings are beside new buildings and, and how that really shows how the place taking shape. Then he mentioned a little bit about Walter Benjamin. Uh, if you remember, I think Walter Benjamin might have been the person to talk a little bit about a uh, whole series of other issues. But okay, whether you remember that or not doesn't really matter. What's important is that he has kind of explains the presence of people. That without this presence of people, streets and cities will remain with their histories. Can I tell you a little bit more about this presence of people? Uh, in some of his earlier interviews, he mentioned that he purposely tried to capture these scenes without people. The reason being, if you notice that um, the cameras that he was using, it is a large format. For him to be able to manually adjust and get the details sharp enough, get them all the way to the back, uh, the exposure time is quite long, correct? Because the aperture is smaller. For, aperture, for the exposure time to be somewhat like 5 seconds, uh, if you have people, they will definitely be blur. So it's a conscious decision at that point to purposely wake up early in the morning or to wait on a quiet street until you can get a shot without anybody. So that's a little bit of just FYI on the how for you. Okay. Uh, back to this, he has this interest in places with historical resonance due to his background. Uh, what background is this? You may have noticed later on when he talks about the places, he did mention that he grew up in post-war Germany. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that his parents would be have been the ones that directly uh, experienced the war, played a part in the war, uh, fought in the war. Okay, so growing up over there, I think he feels a lot of the historical weight on himself as well. Uh, and it's and to him, to him, his country still reflects the damage from the war and fascism um, in the time that he grew up. And so he was very interested in this. Got him first interested in his own city. Regarding portraits then, okay, he described it as not an outer appearance but a moment of a person, the person's state of mind as the photograph is being taken. Uh, he mentioned how as well, that he only takes the people that he's familiar with. Hmm, okay, I want to talk about this because I thought that this was such a good illustration of his, of his thinking process. And I'll describe it this way that one of Stroh's, uh, one of Stroh's techniques, I suppose, or ways that he chooses to work, uh, whether it be portraits or other things, is the ability that he has, uh, and the way that he spends his attention on the nuanced study and selection of, of um, between different photographs, for what selection of the desired state of mind of the subject. You notice that he's very aware that in a fleeting moment, people's expressions can reveal their, their changing thoughts. Mm? And at the end of it, he aims in a photograph for the atmosphere and the environment. He says that the sitter will provide the position, isn't it? Okay. But this even selection, he's able to look into and examine his portraits and, and go like, okay, um, this is the moment whereby this person's relaxed. She's she's actually blanking out at this point. But looking at her child, uh, what is the what is the child thinking at this point based on the pose, based on the expression, and he's able to make the selection uh based on that. Yeah? Then he moved on to talk about family portraits. Okay. Uh he this part he put very shortly, but family is something that cannot be ignored. It shapes one's he sh it shapes history. I suppose in this point he means it shapes one's history, one's experiences which uh, indeed is very true. Okay, now the museum series that actually brought uh, a lot of attention to him. Um, regarding the museum series, there is a similarity between the people and the painting before them. And he mentioned that without this resemblance, the photograph is useless or worthless. Wow, okay, that's quite, that's quite something. Have you ever thought 
thought of um, photographing people, looking at pictures, and at the same time trying to make them um, have this kind of similarity. What about it in a photograph that, that uh, or in an image for that matter, that is compositionally, uh, not say incredibly balanced or, or anything, but compositionally grasping. Isn't there this repetition going on? The people looking at you, the lady looking at you, the repetition going on, the similarity in shape. And uh, to me, that's, that's what makes the design in itself quite, uh, quite fascinating. And these are mostly, I wouldn't say candid, but uh, authentic shots in the sense that none of these people are really posing. These are just their natural, um, natural positions when they come to encounter the works. So what I think what what brings this series really uh, to prominence, okay, is that the museum, um, by using the museum, he's using the photograph to bring out thoughts about why are the people there, why are, what are they doing there, uh, how, how they are posed, what are they looking at, like to go so far as to uh, people are able to look at uh, this lady and go, okay, she's maybe flipping a little guide, she's trying to tune in to the right number to listen for the description and so on. Okay, but at the same time, the relationship of people with historical paintings. So I mentioned history is very important to Struth. Uh, likewise, you notice all these paintings that he's going for, not because they're famous, but because they are historical. Now, uh, I want to add on to it. This isn't in the video, but I thought that this was very interesting. This was displayed in uh, Singapore Art Museum in 8Q uh, sometime last year. Um, great to parody, because you have a circle going on up there. Do you notice this? circle thing that the students are in as well and then likewise when we went as a school group we sat in a circle in front of it and it was just so nice to parody um, what was going on in the photograph okay not only are they looking at iconic works it's not the works that make this photograph good it's not but it's the fact that what it evokes it evokes this complex social ritual of seeing and being seen and the way that art survives in public collections, but more importantly, focus on this part, complex social rituals of seeing. So a lot of people like to use um, Struth's photograph, museum series photograph, to start talking about, about seeing and how do we relate to, to uh, artworks that we see. And it's really playing on this very familiar notion of how, how do we behave then in museums? How do we see things in museums? Do we stop in front of things? How do we hold discussions in museums? So a series that... Uh, actually, it's very thought-provoking, yeah? Okay. Paradise series! Uh, interestingly, he brought up this part, political conflict between East and West. Okay, so interest in what a new paradise will look like. Uh, he mentioned that it is working outside what he's normally used to. Uh, I want to mention two other things that he didn't mention in the video. Uh, one is that, where does he take all these? So you may want to take note certain of the, some countries that he uh, purposely travelled to to get these photos. Um, I'm not doing a comparison with Gursky, uh, but you can definitely see that they do have similar methods of working in that as photographers, they do travel to find the subject matter that they're looking for. I want to point out to you, um, in some other interviews, he always mentions a lot of uh, different things through different interviews. So this is what I picked up. He mentioned as well that these large uh, pictures, as printed out as large as Gursky's ones, um, there's a certain, it's not sublime, but it does evoke a certain stillness in it. Imagine yourself going to the museum and encountering large photographs of these uh, jungle or forests. It doesn't straight away make, it doesn't provoke a uh, immediate reaction. It makes you go like whoa and so on, but it does make you stop for a while and start to look and start to look and consider and contemplate. So there's this certain um, stillness that strangely comes out of this of this series. Okay, uh, in other interviews he mentions the interest in complex visual structures, or is also what um. It may seem very gusky, uh, but it's also what a lot of critics have pointed out to be similar um, in terms of how he moved from this paradise series into the world of machines, the complex visual structures. Okay, uh, I did it that way because if I were to actually plug in all the information from the latest one, it will look something like this. 
pretty messy. Now, we're not going to linger here because we've roughly talked about all of these in the last few slides. Ah, okay, how? This part is not mentioned in either of the video, but I thought I want to let you know as well. Now, this part, you notice a uh, Gursky came to photograph the minor shaft, uh, the minus, um, clothes changing area with uh, lights and all that so that he can get the, the look that he wants, the sharpness that he wants. Uh, Struth, however, now this is a difference, but quite interesting one. He uses daylight. I'll share with you about this particular piece. It's commissioned. Um, the Queen's people essentially contacted Struth and asked him to, Would you, could you do this portrait for the Queen? Uh, and he said, okay. And he had to actually look around within the palace, which room is he going to use. Now, this is actually the green room. Um, the queen has this thing about coordination. Um, maybe it's not her, maybe it's the lady who dresses her. But in the in Buckingham Palace, there is rooms that is like, okay, this is the red room, this is the white room. And so, Gursky makes all these decisions even to go like, okay, red doesn't look good on the skin. Uh, let's use a green room instead. Uh, to choosing the queen's outfit, positioning what chair you're going to use, how they're going to sit, and so on. So, let's look at the use of sunlight though. Because I'll show you another family portrait that he has done. Now, you may not think this is vaguely related, but if we just focus on the use of lighting, natural lighting, natural look, you're playing with the fact that what is catching the sun and what is not, what is not, to bring out the for, uh, to bring out what's in the foreground, which is the people. Okay, his, his, uh, although he'll deny it that his, uh, his interest is not in the, uh, not at all in the, um, what shall we call it? Not in the composition, not about lighting, it's much more than that. But definitely as a photographer, he does have a, a bit of an eye for that. So that you can take note that this is technique as well. Uh, it contrasts against Gursky uh, with the highly Photoshop and the uh, stage lighting. Alright, now I'm going to come to some of the things that Gursky, that sorry, that Struth mentions. Um, I mentioned right at the start, his interest in history. I want to mention his interest in the narrative as well, okay? Uh, the narrative, this comes from his series, this tree, comes from his series, let me think, what is it, huh? Uh, at the start, we saw the black and white ones, so this is the continuation of it after he, years later when he decides that I'm going to use colour for it to study all these buildings. Sometimes he'll even travel to the place um, without research, without expectations, and just take photograph the place as it strikes him to be, as his reading of the place strikes him to be. Okay, uh, What is he bringing out then in the way that he has done this? The narrative. He reads the environment. He digests it, and then he thinks about how is he going to showcase it through the photograph. He sees the city as a place of social narrative, social narrative, uh, because it is very true that our architecture determines our shared experiences. Yeah? Okay, this is from an interview. Um, now, if you see the way that, that Struth talks about his work, sometimes in some of his uh, other interviews, um, he goes off on his own train of thought, and I find it not everyone is that easy to follow. Uh, but nonetheless, my, my feeling about 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 Struff talking about his work is that he really thinks a lot. He really thinks a lot. To have a in narrative is an incentive. It was only about composition and light and beautiful pictures. I could just photograph flowers. Yeah. To him, this narrative is an incentive to get started, but at the same time also prompt the audience, the prompt the viewer to carry on thinking. He did uh, mention that for some of his photographs, he feels that the title actually is more of a prompt. For example, the Paradise series. The, the title should be the thing that is stirring people up to, to begin thinking about it. Rather than from the visuals, people may get quite different ideas. But from the titles, that is also can be another starting point. Yeah? Uh, another quote by him. Okay. Um, what elements compose our sense of reality? Okay, what constitutes common sense under impact of constant flow of individual experiences? How can picture making educate and order perception, stabilize or irritate our existence? Now, if you find this part quite uh, chim, 
Uh, so do I. All right. I'm going to simplify it quite a bit. Let's look at this other quote, also by him. When you look at a picture, you start to develop narratives. My function is to make the narrative legible. Now, if you're going to remember one quote, maybe you can take note of this one. Okay, to develop narratives, he is... Uh, he, I don't think he will consider himself a storyteller. Um, it is not his objective to like, oh, make a comic, make a film, uh, do it like a Cindy Sherman style. No, not at all. However, every photograph that he selects to show you has this thoughtfulness to it, this artfulness, but also a thoughtfulness to it, that it starts to prompt you to, to think already. Just looking at anyone in isolation, look at it. Eventually, you'll arrive at a word narrative as well. Okay, uh, so that will be all for me. Some preferences. This p last one especially, it has... Um, they kind of classify it based on his themes as well, based on his series. So you may want to look into that. It doesn't showcase his full body of work, but enough for you to get a sense of what it looks like. Okay, thank you. That will be all.